Today's scripture comes from Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here until I, while I go yonder and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and sore troubled. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Abide ye here, and watch with me. And he went forward a little, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying again the same words. Then cometh he to the, to the disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest, Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold, he, he is at hand that betrayeth me. It's good to see everyone this morning. We're always glad to be able to assemble with those of like precious faith. We have attempted over the last several weeks to spend some time looking at the emotions of Jesus. It's important for us to recognize that we're created beings, and according to Genesis chapter 2, that we were created in God's likeness, in His image. And so those emotions that we have, God has created in us. Now what happens along the way, sometimes we have emotions that we are not allowing God to control and to educate and to discipline, and so sometimes those emotions get out of control or they're mistaught and misapplications made. So we've tried to look at those things, the joy that, that we are to feel and the joy that was brought to this earth at Jesus' birth and all those things that cause us to understand the emotion of joy. Because that's who Jesus was, and that's what Jesus did, and that's an example. So we've tried to take him as an example of those emotions so that you and I would know what those were to be like. Now, we can misapply joy and think that means that we should always be made happy, that we get our way about things, and maybe that's how we define it. That's not the kind of joy that, that Jesus experienced, and we talked about those things. But he was a man of sorrow also and acquainted with grief. So we understood what sorrow was like, not just joy, but sorrow. And God sorrows over our choices and our decisions in life. It, it, even in Genesis chapter 6, it repented God that even made man. He sorrowed over their choice. He was disappointed in what they experienced. It grieved him. But we also looked at the fact that we could be angry and sin not. So we've been given the emotion of anger where we could express ourselves that we have righteous indignation, that we feel like God feels about sin and, and the behavior of sin, but that we know how to channel that, that we don't sin in that process. Then last week we looked at love being the emotion. In all those circumstances, there are, are proper ways for that emotion to be expressed and channeled, and there are improper ways for those emotions to be channeled. When we're looking at love, when it's misdirected, it turns into lust. It becomes a very selfish thing. That we get something at somebody else's expense, and that's not the emotion that described that God placed in us. That kind of love has, allows us to be compassionate and caring. That we could then exercise and do those things that are necessary for other people's well-being. It's important that we have that emotion, that affection. The one we'll talk about this morning is 
one that we become uncomfortable with, at least I become uncomfortable with, talking about in reference to Jesus, and that's the emotion of fear. Now we think about the creator of all things. What would he fear? And some of that's because of our definition of, of fear, that we just get scared of something, and, and it cripples us, and it paralyzes us, it causes us not to be able to function. And that certainly can happen. That can be a channeling of fear in a way that could be destructive. But that's not how the experience of Jesus that was just read for you describes his fear. He wasn't afraid in the sense that he was paralyzed and that he wasn't going to carry out his mission, but he demonstrates for us and models for us what the real emotion of fear should be. God gave us that emotion. It was intended, and when you look at the Greek word for fear, and it, it is phobos. And that is a, an apprehension, an alertness that happens. And, and all of us have, in certain circumstances, maybe we're not overly familiar with, or maybe we are familiar with them, and we know the seriousness of the circumstances, we get on high alert. And so we get a little anxious. Now, because we allow anxiety to control us sometimes and to paralyze us sometimes, we, we find it hard to say, Jesus became anxious. Like, why would Jesus become anxious? He's deity. He's God. Why would he be anxious? He didn't have anxiety in the sense that he couldn't function. Just the opposite. He demonstrates for us what that emotion should be and, and could be in our life and needs to be in our life. And when you look at that, it is a, a dread of a sense. There are some things in our, our life that we, we dread because we know the seriousness of them. When you look at the Greek word, that's where we get our word phobia. And through my counseling training, there's all kinds of phobias. People have all kinds of fears about all kinds of things. And there's a long list of those, those fears, and, and it paralyzes people. You may be afraid of spy, spiders, and so you just can't function if you see a spider. You block everything out, and our emotions never were given to us so that we couldn't function. They were all given to us so we could function fully. We could be everything God wanted us to be, and in the way He wanted us to be, those beings. But if we misapply those or misunderstand those or we misuse those, then they become a problem for us. Jesus models for us in what was read in Matthew 26 exactly how fear ought to work. That emotion of fear. You see, what took place before what Tommy read for us was what we often do, and what Billy Wayne referred to this morning when he mentioned uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in his prayer. Because Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 quotes from Luke chapter 22, which is the same context of Matthew 26. And that's where he gathers his disciples together and they partake of that Passover meal and he institutes the Lord's Supper. Those emblems, the bread would represent his body and the fruit of the vine would represent his blood. Then he told him he wouldn't drink it with them again until he drank it anew with them in the Father's kingdom. Then he quoted a passage from Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 7. He said, here's what's going to happen. The shepherd's going to be smitten. You're all going to be offended. They were going to become afraid and, and they were going to scatter. Their emotions were going to get away from them, and, and they were not going to be able to carry out what they had thought they could carry out. So he tells them what's coming. The, the, he's going to be betrayed, and he's going, to, uh, uh, he's going to die, and so he's trying to fix their minds around those things, and he said, it was prophesied. Here's what's going to happen. Now, they had a discussion among themselves. If you look at Matthew's account that was read for us, if you look at Luke's account in Luke 22, and you look at Mark's account in Matthew uh, in Mark chapter 14, you get a, a broader picture of all those things that are taking place with his disciples. And they all began to say, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we're not going to flee. You can count on us. 
And now we blame all that on Peter because Peter is the one who usually becomes the spokesman, but it said, so said they all. We won't forsake you. We won't flee. And then we have the account. Then we have Jesus leaving his disciples, the majority of his disciples, and he takes Peter, James, and John with him, and he goes a certain distance. And then that dramatic scene of this prayer that he prays to the Father. Again, if you take all those accounts together, there's some terminology that's used. He became exceedingly sorrowful. Mark said he was amazed, astonished. And so we began to get an image of Jesus in these circumstances that he knew was going to happen. That he was fully aware that he was going to die and he told them he was going to die. But now he's about to prepare for his death. It is an amazing thing to him and an astonishing thing to him to feel the magnitude of what's about to happen. So he models that for us. Now here's some things we need to make sure we understand before we go any further. You know, there's a difference between the emotion of fear and the spirit of fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Then it talks about that boldness that we can have because we have that been given to us. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Now, the emotion of fear we've described is that apprehension, that alertness that we've been given. That we can say, there's some dangers here. There's some circumstances I need to pay real close attention to. These circumstances could change depending on how I react. And so there's this alertness that we have, that this fear that comes in us, it's emotion saying, you better take this seriously. Sometimes we describe in a negative sense, well, that person's fearless. Generally, we mean that they're reckless. <laughs> now, we say they're fearless, and they jump off of high places, you know, and, and, and they do daredevil things, and, and they're just fearless. Well, that's not a good thing to be. Because, you see, when you take those kind of chances, you put yourself at risk. The emotion was given to reduce the risk. That causes us to be able to say, pay attention here. This would go one way or the other. You have this anxiousness of saying, I'm going to be real alert. We've used passages like 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, where it said, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, we don't go around quaking because we're afraid of of Satan and we're scared of him all the time but we better have fear about the circumstances that he can create and we better be attuned to it there's a certain anxiousness that would cause us to be alert Jesus is at that point his emotions are on high alert he knows what's coming he knows the seriousness of it and the magnitude of that has his senses exercised we can see them. We can hear them. He's expressed them at the highest possible level. This is it. This is what he came for. And they are coming to get him. Not again. He's fully aware from the, from the deity side of it. He's fully aware that he could petition the Father and he'd send 12 legions of angels. And, and so that part is not he's afraid or he's scared. He just knows what's about to happen and why. And so he's on that full alert. According to Colossians 2 and verse 9, speaking of Christ, that God had provided it in him all the fullness of Godhead dwells. So that's the deity side. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells. And yet from the humanity side... The side that you and I relate to and the example of this emotion for us is found in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. 
We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but in all points, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So the emotion we're seeing, he's experiencing. The emotions we're reading about, Jesus embodies. But he doesn't sin. And yet we realize that that word fear is used sometimes to describe the fact that we can sin. And God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And so that alertness that we have in our emotion, God gave it to us. The spirit of fear, the influence that would cause us not to carry out what God has commissioned us to carry out, God hasn't given us that influence. Much like James chapter 1 when he said, Don't say when you're tempted, I'm tempted with God, for God tempteth no man. He cannot be tempted with evil, neither he tempteth any man. But a man is tempted, listen, when he's drawn away of his own lust. Remember we said when you don't channel the emotion of love correctly, it turns into lust. So if we don't take that emotion of love that would cause us to be attracted to each other, to, to have a, a brotherly love for each other, that, that we would have agape love for each other, if we don't channel that correctly, it can turn into lust. And so if that happens, don't say that came from God. God didn't give us the spirit of lust, the influence of lust. He doesn't tempt us, and he's not tempted with it. But a man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when that enticement takes place, before long you realize we sin. We transgress God's will. We, we're not channeling that the way God intended for us to. And that brings forth death, separates us from God. When the emotions were given, to connect us to God. So let's quickly look at how Jesus modeled for us how to handle the emotion of fear. First of all, he recognized the seriousness of the situation. That's what we need to do, and that's why we couldn't wear with a badge, well, that person's fearless, where we'd endanger ourselves or endanger other people because we didn't pay attention to the circumstances. Jesus knew what was going to happen to his disciples because of him. He was fully aware of that. He understand how disconcerting it was going to be when he left them. He knew all the circumstances of that, and we're at that time. So he was fully aware of the, the circumstances, the seriousness of those circumstances. And when you look at that in, in chapter 26 and verse 37, as he took the disciples with him, he became to be sorrowful and very heavy. Fully aware of it. This is a serious situation. He's on high alert. His apprehension about what's to take place and what's going to happen to them when it takes place, he's on high alert. He's fully aware of it. He's conscious of it. He's experiencing what you and I experience with that emotion. He knows what it feels like. This is a serious matter. In Luke 22 and verse 44, it describes that being so intense that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Serious. He's bowed down, understanding it. Now, in that context, it also says that heaven, God, sent an angel to strengthen him. It's a serious matter. Now, he's not paralyzed, and, and he hasn't had that influence of fear in the sense that it would cause him not to do what he came to do, but he's aware of the circumstances. And the second thing we see is that he models for us is that he reached out to others. Now, he didn't take all of his disciples with him, but he took Peter, James, and John, and he asked them to watch with him. Watch with me. Describe the seriousness of it. Help them be on alert because of it. Wasn't causing uh, fear where they would run away, even though he said, the prophet said, here's what's going to happen to you, so pay attention. Be watchful. Watch with me. And then he said, I'm going to go yonder. You read all the accounts together, he said he went a stone's throw. So it didn't go far. But he left them there to 
be with him. And then he reached out to the Father. The time has arrived. He is fully alert. The apprehension is real. The circumstances are inescapable. He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. You see, it models for us that we should surround ourselves with people that can watch with us. That can be alert about those circumstances with us. Peter, James, and John were asked to. God is connected with. He's, he's not leaving himself isolated somewhere and his fear crippling him so he can't function. But he's got his senses exercised and he's fully aware. And so he reaches out. Because of what he recognizes about the circumstances, he reaches out. We can learn from that in our emotions. We need to reach out, surround ourselves with people that can watch with us. Pay attention to those circumstances so we understand the seriousness of it and they can help us navigate the circumstances. Now we need to also be aware that, as Jesus was, that people don't always pay the same kind of attention we do. Maybe they see too much danger and maybe the disciples are sleeping because that's how they handle fear. <laughs> you used to go to sleep and ignore it. Now, hey, they understand he's in sorrow. They're sorrowing with him, but they fall asleep. But Jesus asked them, could you not watch with me one hour? And then he reminds them again, you watch so you don't fall into temptation. There's that alertness, that, that being aware that your senses, you, your fear, that emotion that you're paying attention to these hours. And then he goes back to the Father. There's some repetitious in his reaching out to his disciples and to his Father. We can learn from that. Sometimes with our fears, we just kind of withdraw, don't we? Isolate ourselves from people. Remove ourselves from God and go, God disappointed in us because we, we are afraid. Well, it depends on how our fear is expressed. There was every reason in the world for the Israelite people when they were standing next to the Red Sea and they saw the approaching Egyptian army. There was every reason in the world for that emotion of fear to be on high alert. <laughs> they served their whole life under this brutal dictatorship in Egypt. They knew what could be done to them. Their senses were on alert and, and they, their fear became to the surface. Not anything wrong with that. Until you hear their voices. A mischannel, that alertness. They said, what did you bring us out here for? It had been better if we died in Egypt. Then the voice from God channeled through Moses said, You tell the people, fear not. And stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. The fact that they're going to be on alert, they couldn't escape it. They knew what the approaching armies would intend to do. They'd rather die in a familiar place, but you see that emotion was part of who they were. But how they channeled that was about to cause them to sin, just to leave God out. But when they were commissioned to stand still, they could assess the situation. And they weren't alone. Moses was there with them. They were there with each other. But most of all, he said, you stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You're not alone. And then the charge was, you tell the people to go forward. When you stand still and, and that emotion is real and you are alert and you understand the dangers that are coming, you'll also be able to clearly see the salvation that's provided. Jesus knew that he came to save us. But his fear, his anxiety, his apprehension of the means of that taking place put him on high alert. And he saw the seriousness of it, and he, 
He reached out to those who were closest to him. But he also sought a selection of options. Now, he didn't give God options. See, sometimes when I'm upset or I'm afraid, you know, you're going to take that away or I'm not going to serve you. Okay, now, now if I'm going to be in this with you, then I don't want to have to deal with that. I don't want to get up and, and speak in any kind of public way because, and, and I began to make all kinds of excuses, and I made them all because of the emotion of fear. But Jesus' approach was, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. When you put them all together, he says in the second go around, he said, if this cup cannot pass from me, if this is something that has to be done, and it has to be done in this way, thy will be done. See, that models for us. How do you channel that emotion? Oh, you understand the seriousness of it? Is it overwhelming if you were left by yourself? Sure it would be. But he wasn't alone. The Father was with him. and He understood that. And then finally we see that he channeled that, that emotion, that fear, when it was obvious. There are no other options. There's not another choice to select. Fear causes us to look at choices, you know. You remember that, that old uh, Jerry Clower joke about uh, the snake handling? And said, where's the door? And said, we don't have a door. So said, reckon where they want one. Well, you're looking at options here. The, that fear of understanding the danger. Now, how do I get away from this? What do I do with this? Jesus said, is there another way? Yet not my will, but thine be done. We're going to have that anxiousness, that alertness, that fear because of the seriousness of our spiritual life. The Lord tells us that we're going to suffer like He suffered. That's not something we just whistle about, is it? It's something that's serious. But with some people, it paralyzes them. They channel that emotion in a way that they can do nothing. We boil it down in the counseling world of that, that, that fight or flight or freeze emotion. That fear comes up, you know, that anxiety that we have, and, and it'll cause us either to, to fight our way out of a circumstance. We recognize the circumstance. Or to run from it. Or sometimes we just freeze. And do nothing. Jesus models for us how we ought to handle it. And, and that is surround ourselves with the people who can provide for us support. Be patient with them. Repeat our desire for them. But most of all, stay present with God. And it's okay to check out options if they're God's options. But it's not okay for us to negotiate with God and say it's either or. Either you remove this or I'll remove myself. Notice in all these circumstances, Jesus was focused on, on God. When you boil all that down, that alertness, that fear, that emotion that came up in Jesus, that was so intense that He prayed so fervently, that his sweat was like drops of blood. This was serious, serious, intense praying about this serious circumstance. But then you see him going to his disciples and said, Arise, they're waiting on us. Who's waiting on us? They're coming. Who's coming? Those who betray me are at hand. Judas was on his way with the people he betrayed Jesus into their hand. Now his emotion of fear has been channeled. 
He submitted to the Father's will. That's where you and I have to be. And even if we get to the point where physically it might cost us our life, who is going to say, I'm not afraid. I have fear. Reverential fear. You see, when you look at passages like 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, it reminds us that there's no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. It can get rid of fear, the kind of fear that would cripple us. And he describes how that takes place. Because we don't have the spirit of fear. We don't have the disposition of fear. We, we weren't given something that we don't have any choice in. It'll cast it out. Because we'll be able to put it in the right context. And we'll then submit to whatever the Lord's will is. I don't know about you, but there have been lots of circumstances in my life where I've let fear absolutely cripple me, keep me from doing something that I really wanted to do for my family, for my community, for God. And I channeled that fear in a way that wasn't constructive. That even came, became destructive. And trying to get away from it. Aren't you glad that the Bible takes these emotions and allows Jesus to embody them and to exercise them in a way we can say, sure, that's a real emotion. It's a healthy emotion. It's a needed emotion. But we need to control the emotion and not the emotion controlling us. And that's what Jesus did. The emotion was there. He demonstrated the emotions there, but He controlled it. Just like He did when we talked about anger. He restrained it. He controlled it. This fear was real. He looked at all the options. He submitted to the Lord's will. Submitted to the Father's will. And then He told His disciples, let's go. He modeled for them forever. Now here's what you do. You go and face your fear. And He did. And He did that for us. If you're here this morning and not a child of God, it may be that fear keeps you from acknowledging publicly that you believe that Jesus is God's Son. It may be that fear that you can't be perfect would keep you from turning away from your sins and repentance. It may be that fear that's channeled in the wrong way might keep you from confessing with your own lips because of the circumstances of those that you would confess it in front of. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It may be that fear keeps you from submitting your Lord in baptism to wash away your past sin because you're afraid you can't walk in that newness of life. Jesus models for us how we handle, how we channel the emotion of fear. Maybe some of us who have done those things, but when it comes to participating in carrying out the services of the Lord, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, becoming part of that body that's fitly joined together by that which every joint supplies, you're afraid you might fail at what you should supply. Jesus modeled for us how to address that emotion in a proper way. In a healthy way. Will you be alert to say, I'm needed. I have to have other people to help me. I want to be a help to other people. You see, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What about you this morning? Are you willing to overcome that fear? While together we stand, while we sing. <clears throat>